bit, quite a bit more today. <clears throat> we'll see. Right towards the end of Hamlet's famous to be or not to be speech. Um, which I am emphatically calling not a soliloquy, okay? For the reason that Ophelia's on the stage and um, <clears throat> probably probably behind one of these curtains, which is called an heiress, you've got Claudius and Polonius standing. It's pretty clear to me, as we'll see in just a moment, um, <coughs> Claudius and Polonius have got to be on the stage because the very first thing out of Claudius' mouth when he quote-unquote enters the stage, he indicates he heard everything Hamlet said. Now, if he's back here in what's called the Tyrene House, which is where they change costumes and all that kind of stuff. Within the world of the play, he can't hear it. It's like being in a totally separate room, other part of the castle, so to speak. Okay? So that's, those are the reasons why it's not a soliloquy. The main one, Ophelia's on the stage. Okay? So Hamlet's not alone. So Hamlet finishes that speech, with what we talked about the other day, and then he sees Ophelia. Or maybe he, you know, delivers a speech and he indicates again, soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. And notice, then he addresses her. The soft you now, the fair Ophelia, that could be, oh golly gee, there's Ophelia, okay? It could also be Hamlet's indicating to the audience. I knew she was here all along. All along. But then he addresses her. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. In orisons, if you look to the cross, uh, it tells you it means prayers. <coughs> Is he saying to her, <coughs> excuse me, Ophelia, when you pray, pray to God and say, and oh God, remember all of Hamlet's sins. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, Remember my sins in your prayers. That is, remember to ask forgiveness for me. Okay? We're going to see at the end of the play, Hamlet's going to ask forgiveness to somebody for that person's death and that person's father's death, Laertes and Polonius. And Polonius is going to, uh, excuse me, Laertes is going to ask forgiveness for his murder of Hamlet. Okay? And they both grant him, by the way. Okay? So, Ophelia. Good, my lord, because he asked, how are you, essentially? Good, my lord, how does your honor for this many a day? This many a day kind of implies, I've not seen you for a while. Okay. Well, just before this scene began, Ophelia has said, you know, that she's, she's kind of turned down Hamlet's advances. She's turned away letters and such. Now she kind of implies or the text kind of implies, it's been a few days that have gone by. <clears throat> so, she asks him, how are you doing? Thank you. Uh, well, well, well. She says, my lord, I have remembrances of yours. And she pulls out of somewhere a packet of papers. These are letters, poems, cards that Hamlet has delivered to her. Not necessarily in the last day or two, but like from the beginning of their relationship. Not me, not I, I never gave you aught. I never gave you anything. Uh, my honored Lord, you know right well you did. So Hamlet says, that's not mine. You know they're yours. And with them, that is, when you gave them to me, <clears throat> Words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. She doesn't mean literally you breathed on them and they smelled better. She means 
with such rich spirit composed. Your love just exudes through these words. That's why she says it made them more rich, but their perfume lost. What's the perfume? It's that love. How is that love lost? Is she saying, Hamlet, you no longer love me? No, because she doesn't know that. Not yet. How's the love lost? Her father and her brother told her, you cannot love Hamlet. He's out of your league. The love is lost on her side. Okay? So she says, take him back. They don't mean anything to me anymore. For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when, prove, when givers prove unkind. Ah, that's where she's getting at the rich breath, the rich perfume no longer has its power. Why? What did her brother, almost said father, what did her brother and father tell her about Hamlet's love? What was it really? Say it. No. Did they say, oh yeah, Hamlet really loves you. He wants to marry you and live with you happily ever after. No. What did they say? He wants sex. It's lust. You are, as Polonius put it, a trifle. Something to be played with. And then what happens when you're tired of playing with something? You throw it away. You're like a toy to a little kid on Christmas Day. December 26th rolls around. I want a new toy. That's what she means when she says, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. And there's that word prove again. We've seen it in relation to try, prove, test. It all means let's examine. Let's see whether something is real. Here, what's, what's been the proving? Has Hamlet's love been proven, been tested? Not yet. She's taking what her father and brother says is truth. So what's she doing with what Hamlet said? It's a lie. She's not proven anything. She's merely taking an assertion to be truth. Okay? So she says, because you don't really love me, because the words that you wrote in these papers are lies, take them back. Okay? Now, do we get any indication anywhere in the play that Ophelia is ever quote-unquote, acting, pretending. Not really. Hamlet we do. Hamlet tells us. If perchance later on I put on an active disposition, don't give out that you know what I'm doing. Okay? Hamlet refers to play acting, his opening speech to his mother. These are actions a man may play at. But I have that which in he says, which surpass, but surpasseth show. All we know about Ophelia is her father told her, be here and talk to Hamlet. He hasn't told her what to say in this instance. He hasn't told her what to say. Okay? So, Hamlet, <laughs> like, okay. And I think at that point, at that point, Hamlet realizes what's happening. When she says, you don't love me, Hamlet realizes she's been put up to this. Are you honest? Your gloss tells you, what does honest mean? It's uh, line 102 or so. Honest meaning truthful and chaste. Chaste, virginal. Okay? Are you honest? He asks. So, are you telling the truth as well as are you a truthful, generally honest person? And are you chaste? Have you not slept with anyone? My lord, that is. Where does that come from? What do you. What? Explain. 
Are you fair? Fair means beautiful. So are you truthful? Are you chaste? And are you beautiful? What means, what are you getting at? What's your point, Hamlet? That if you be honest and fair, keep in mind the two meanings of honest, truthful and chaste. If you be truthful and chaste and beautiful, that's fair, your honesty, your truthfulness, and your chastity should admit no discourse to your beauty. And you've got a gloss down there. Honest meaning truthful and chaste, fair meaning just honorable, line 105, beautiful, line 107, are not mere quibbles. The speech is the irony of a double entendre. The only problem is your gloss doesn't tell you what the double entendre is. So, are you truthful? Are you chaste? Are you fair? Which your gloss tells you also means just and honorable. It also means beautiful, as I've been pointing out. So, he says, your truthfulness, your chastity, your beauty should admit no discourse to your beauty. What's meant by discourse? Discourse is just a fancy word for talk, interchange, communication. He's saying your honesty and your fairness shouldn't admit communication, <laughs> shouldn't communicate with or via your beauty. He's talking about how beauty can be used as a means for what? What did he call Polonius when Polonius said, do you know me, my lord? A fishmonger. And your gloss tells you fishmonger means bond, procurer, pimp. All right? He's saying your honesty, your fairness should not be pimps for your beauty. She doesn't quite get that. She says, could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Could beauty be tied to anything better than honesty, their meaning chastity? Shouldn't beauty be chaste? Because bear in mind, within sex within marriage is still considered chastity. It's only sex outside of marriage that's considered unchaste. So she says, shouldn't beauty go along with honesty? Aye, truly. For the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is, truthfulness, chastity, from what it is to a bawd, a pimp, a madam. Then the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. Notice, the power of beauty will do what? It will seduce. It will change honesty into dishonesty, dischastity. Okay? This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives a proof. And then he says, you're right. I did love you once. When I sent you these papers, I loved you. Past tense. I don't anymore. He hasn't said I don't anymore. He just says, I did love you once. And the once emphasizes the did. That doesn't mean I no longer love you. Okay? Indeed, my Lord, you made me believe so. I thought you did. You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Look at your gloss down there, 115. Inoculate, graft, metaphorical. What does it mean, graft? And then you got the stupid metaphorical. Well, stock. Okay, here's a tree. Got branches and such that come out. Let's say, you know, it's an apple tree. Okay, what can you do with that apple tree? You can cut a branch off. And at this point, you could put a pear tree branch on that tree. So that from that one tree, you will get two different kinds of fruit. I've got a fruit tree at home. It's called a fruit cocktail tree. It's got an apricot, peach, plum, 
something else. And something else died. That Christ died. Right? That's what he's talking about in terms of horticulture, plant culture. Okay? He's also talking about something else. The old stock. Adam. It's biblical language. The New Testament. Paul frequently uses, refers to the old Adam, 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 Garden of Eden, Adam, and the new Adam, Christ. All right? The old Eve in the early church, Eve, Garden of Eden, the new Eve, Mary, who becomes, who replaces Eve as the mother of all people, marries the mother of all Christians, so to speak. Okay? So, when he says, virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Virtue, by that he means good, right behavior. It cannot, if it, this is the old Adam, then what does that mean? Sinful. We can't cut that off and put on the new Adam, Christianity, become Christian, and good behavior will take care of this. Okay, notice, this is a theological issue. This is no, we're, we're no longer in literary studies. This is theological stuff. And what's his point? This is a big debate at the time between Catholics and Protestants. Okay? And we're going to break, get into that debate even more clearly in a few, hopefully, in a few moments. He's saying, works versus faith, which we'll talk about in a moment. How is one, quote unquote, justified? By works or by faith? Okay, so he says again, I, but now he changes it. He said before, I did love you once. Now he says, I loved you not. I was lying. I didn't love you. Okay. I was the more deceived. She thought he really did. Get thee to a nunnery. Why? Why, why tell her to go to a nunnery? Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? Catholic idea, original sin is passed on genetically. So therefore, every time a woman discovers she's pregnant, whether in marriage, out of marriage, doesn't matter, what is going to be produced by her when it is born, according to good old medieval Catholic thought, will be a sinner. Which is why the medieval church said, you better baptize that kid quickly. Because if you don't, that baby goes straight to hell. Not purgatory. Hell. Okay? So, why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent honest. Moderately virtuous. Well, how can you be moderately virtuous? I mean, what does that really mean? It's like, well, I'm kind of, sort of pregnant. No, you either are or you aren't. Okay? But yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I've done some stuff, sister, that were to tell you about, you would say, you shouldn't live. But again, that's bringing up, kind of obliquely, an idea we saw in Hamlet's first speech. Maybe I shouldn't be alive. And then in the to be or not to be. I am very proud, and so he tells us some of his sinful, old stock, old Adam stuff. I am proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my back than is my call, than I have thoughts to put them in. Imagination to give them shape, and there's thesis language, or time to act them in. 
What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth, earth, and heaven? Notice he says he's got these ideas. He's got these things going around in his mind that he doesn't have enough thoughts to categorize them, imagination to give them some kind of shape, or time to bring them out into the real world. He's saying his internal life is just rampant with sinful thoughts. Why should such fellows as I breed? Why not just kill us? Well, how can she metaphorically do that? Go to a nunnery. What did he tell Polonius in that little scene where he told Polonius, you know, that he was a fishmonger? He starts to talk about carrying the son breeding maggots. Do you have a daughter? Don't let her walk in the sun. Don't let her breed maggots. So if you read that speech in the light of this speech, what's he mean by maggots? Us. We're the maggots. Why? Because we're, according to someone we'll talk about in just a minute, according to John Calvin, we are rotten, I'm going to use a phrase from the Harry Potter novels, rotten to the core. John Calvin said totally depraved. Right? That is, there's nothing we do that isn't sinful, that isn't touched by sin. <coughs> okay? So, we are errant knaves all. Errant means wandering, misdirected. We, we lack purpose. We lack focus. Believe none of us. What kind of statement is believe none of us? It's absolutist, right? Because what does it mean? Don't believe any man. If you take that literally, then who also is she not to believe? Even as he says that statement, don't believe me. I could be totally wrong. I think this is Hamlet's little clue to Ophelia. Don't take seriously anything I'm telling you right now. I, I think this is Hamlet trying to clue her. I know what's going on in this little situation. That is, I, I kind of know, or at least I have a pretty good guess, who's hiding over there behind the curtains. Don't believe what I'm telling you, Ophelia. You know, wink, wink. How do we know? Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? I don't think he'd ask her where's her father necessarily in this context. Uh, at home, my lord. She just lied. See, she hasn't lied so far up to this point. But now she does. Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. So did he tell her that so that she could run home and say, Oh, Daddy, Polonius, dear, Lord Hamlet says, Let the doors be closed upon you in your own house so that you don't play a fool anywhere but here. What else might that line serve as by Hamlet? What's going to happen before Act 3 is done? Uh, a rat. <laughs> he stabs him. Why? He doesn't stay in his own house. Okay, again, I'm pretty convinced. Hamlet knows exactly where Polonius is. And he says this so that, Did you get that, Polonius? Keep your nose out of my business. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. Ophelia says. She's not talking about her father. She's talking about Hamlet. Why? At that point, she starts to think, Hamlet's going crazy. Crazy. Lunatic crazy. Not lovesick crazy. All right? 
if thou dost marry, so if you don't listen to me and go to a nunnery, and if you do marry, here, I'll give you this plague for dowry. Okay, dowry is the gift that the father gives along with the daughter to the marriage. Okay? Or at the very least, you could say it's the blessing. It's the Father's blessing. Here, he says, I'm going to give you a plague, a curse. Be thou as chaste as ice. How chaste is ice? Do you really want to sleep with ice? No. Chaste as ice, pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. That is, even if you are as frigid as the most frigid woman who has ever lived, you will not escape. What's calumny? A bad reputation. You will not escape bad words. Get thee to a nunnery. Go. Farewell. Or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. Who's the you there? It's not Ophelia, singular. It's all women. And what is the monster that Hamlet says all women make of men? It's the cuckold. Okay? Which was an image from the Middle Ages on of a man with little horns on his head. Had nothing to do with Satan. The horns were indications that his wife had been unfaithful to him. Some weird image that they came up with, okay? So you would see, you know, images of this, and some guy, you know, sitting in his home with little horns, and is usually young, blonde, buxom wife, as an indicator of the young, blonde, buxom wife, was not sexually fulfilled by him. And so, in one great work, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, we have this one tale where a guy essentially says, excuse me, a woman essentially says, you can have me young and beautiful and disloyal. I mean, there will be a turnstile at our doorway because all the men coming in. Or you can have me old and foul and ugly and I'll be faithful to you. And he says, you decide. Okay? It's in the wife of Beth's tale. Okay? So, if you're going to marry, marry a fool. That is, marry someone who is crazy. What did she just say? Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. It could be Hamlet going, I already know what you're going to do to me. Marry me. So he says again, go to a nunnery. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. See, I don't think she's getting what I think Hamlet is trying to get across to her. She just listened to him and says, wow, is he far gone. Hamlet, I've heard of your paintings too. Your women's. What do you mean by paintings? Makeup. Who's the great exemplar at the time when Shakespeare writes this play? It's Queen Elizabeth who there are paintings of with the white face right, in other kinds of makeup. Well enough, God hath given you one face, that is the face you're born with, and you make yourselves another, that is because you don't like the face you're born with. You go to Mr. Max Factor and Maybelline and whoever else, and you make another face for yourself. You jig, you amble, you lisp, you nickname God's creatures, and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll no more on it. It hath made me mad. He's saying, the way you women behave hath made me crazy. I say we will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. Who's the all but one? Aquinas. He's going to die. The rest stay as they are. And Hamlet leaves. And Ophelia gets a great speech. You never hear that this is a soliloquy, though. You never read critics that say, you know, in Ophelia's great soliloquy. Probably because Jason Polonius 
or standing behind a curtain. And Ophelia says, Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. The courtier soldier scholars, I come sword. And what she means by that is Hamlet is the model. He's the epitome of the courtier soldier scholar. He's what every courtier, every hanger on, wants to be. He's what every scholar wants to be. He's what every soldier wants to be. If I could only be like Lord Hamlet. She's telling us that within the society of Denmark, everybody looks at Hamlet and goes, man, if only I could be like that. But what's happened to him? Overthrown. That is, thrown down. Why? Because he's crazy. The expectancy in rows of the fair state. The expectancy. All the state places all their expectations in Hamlet. Okay. Leave, our, leave our current presidential situation totally aside and imagine a country where everybody, where it's not, you know, divided 50-50, but where everybody really looks forward to one person maybe running for president or that person gets elected president and everybody kind of really hoping this person does a great job and succeeds. That's what she's saying. Everybody's put their hopes in Hamlet. The glass of fashion, glass there means mirror. If you're concerned about how you appear, what you do before you leave your home in the morning, you look in the mirror, right? You make sure everything's just fine. Well, that's everybody compares their fashion with how Hamlet dresses. And the mold of form, that is, the physical shape, the, and there it is, the observed of all observers. Hamlet's the fish in the fishbowl. Everybody is watching Hamlet. Now, when she says that, though, it's not necessarily negative. Why is he the observed of all observers, according to the first part of the speech? Because everybody wants to be like that. It's not everybody's spying on Hamlet to see how they can bring him down, according to the first part of the speech of this. All right? The observed of all observers, quite, quite down. She's saying Hamlet used to be on the top of fortune. Now, bottom of her feet. And I. Now she, she moves from talking about Hamlet to talking about herself. Why? Because her, her whole speech, really, it's about their relationship. Because her interaction with Hamlet shows her their relationship, it's, there is none. Not anymore. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, most deject, dejected and wretched, Worthy of sorrow, full of sorrow, that sucked the honey of his musical vows. That is, I listened to his words, I read his poetry, oh no, big little suckers were sweet. I mean, she just lived on those. Now, that, by the way, is why she's the most deject and wretched of women, because she fed on that. And now, see that noble and sovereign reason like sweet bells jangle. Rather than a beautiful bell sound. Okay? Out of time and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. Ecstasy literally means an out-of-body experience where the soul leaves the body. She's saying... His mind has gone elsewhere. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Notice the verb tenses. To have seen what I have seen. That's up into the past, but to this point, because it, it, the kind of verb form it is indicates it began in the past and it goes to now. Okay? What's that referring to? 
to have seen what I have seen, to have seen Hamlet in his, in his prime, when everybody looked up to him, when the women all thought, oh man, if I could only be with Hamlet. And Ophelia's like, he's mine. And all the men looked at Hamlet like, oh, if I could only be like Hamlet. So to have seen what I have seen then, but the what I have seen also continues to now, and then see what I see. This is what he was. This is what he is. Remember when Hamlet, in that the um, his opening soliloquy, oh, that this too too sullied flesh, he goes on and he, he compares. He leaves talking about suicide and stuff, and he compares his dead father with Claudius. His dead father, he says, was as a Hyperion to this satyr. Well, she doesn't use those terms, but that's the kind of thing she's doing. Hamlet was like Hyperion, and now he's like something subhuman because he's lost his reason. The king and Polonius come in. Listen to the king. This is what tells us. They are hidden on the stage. <coughs> Love? Notice, it's an exclamation. His affections do not that way tend. Uh -uh. He's not crazy for love, nor what he spake. That is, his affections aren't because of love. His emotions aren't caused by love, nor what he spake. Notice, Claudius is pretty astute. He listened to Hamlet, and he discerned between the emotions he expressed and the words he expressed. His words weren't about love. Though it lacked form a little. What did Polonius say when Hamlet talked to him about, you know, the fishmonger, the words that he was reading, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? He said, though this be madness, yet there is method to it. It kind of makes sense. That's what Claudius is now saying. Though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. Now there's something in his soul or which is melancholy, sits on brood. Sits on brood. What kind of metaphor is that? What animal sits brooding over its young? Hens on eggs. That's really the only way we talk about that verb to brood. And why does a hen sit on its eggs? To keep them warm so that they'll do what? Hatch. Notice the image. No, his melancholy is sitting on brood over something in his soul. Right? And I no doubt, I do doubt the hatch and the disclose. That is, I don't want to see whatever he's brooding on hatch. Why? Because he doubts what it will be. Doubt's not, doesn't mean, well, golly gee, I wonder what's going to happen. No, he thinks whatever Hamlet is brooding over, it won't be good. All right? Will be some danger. To whom? To Hamlet? Which for to prevent, I have a quick determination, thus set it down. He shall with speed to England. So while he was listening, we're kind of being told. Claudius says, I don't trust this little SOB. <laughs> I'm going to send him to England. Why? To get him away from here. Because he's dangerous, possibly. For the demand of our neglected tribute. That is, the ostensible reason I'm sending Hamlet to demand tribute from England. Well, it'll get him away from here for a while, right? I mean, even psychologists will tell you today. If you can be removed from your immediate situation for a while, you might be able to deal with your issues. That's why people go into rehab places. Okay? So he's sending Hamlet to rehab. Get the gold from, from England, and then he can come back. That's the ostensible, that is, the overt reason. 
What are some other reasons that are given later? For Hamlet's protection, when? After he kills Polonius. So we're told here, before Polonius dies, Hamlet's going to get sent to England. After Polonius dies, he's still going to get sent to England, but now it's for what purpose? It's to protect Hamlet from the people, as well as possibly from Laertes when Laertes returns. But then what's another reason going to be? He's going to send letters that command the king of England to kill Hamlet. Actually, the letters say to kill the bearer of the letters. Or at least, that's what the letter will say when Hamlet replaces it. Okay? So, he goes on. Happily, the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart. Maybe a change of scenery will make Hamlet feel better. Whereon his brain still beating puts him thus from fashion of himself. It, notice, it puts him from fashion of himself. The fashion of himself is how Hamlet appears. His seething brain... The, whatever's wrong in his brain makes Hamlet, Claudius is saying, because Hamlet's going to bring up this idea later, makes Hamlet not Hamlet. It makes him like an empty Hamlet. Okay? Act 5, when we get to it, we're going to see Hamlet use the first ever in history insanity defense when he talks to, uh, talks to Laertes. He's going to say, no, 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 no. I didn't kill your father. It was my, my madness that killed your father. And if it was my madness, then it wasn't me. And if it wasn't Hamlet that did it, then Hamlet can't be accused of doing it, and Hamlet's not guilty of doing it. It was my madness that did it. Okay? So, Polonius says, yeah, 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 you might be right, but I still think it has something to do with love. All right? He says, tell you what, let's do this. After the play that we're about to go see, let his mother, the queen, entreat him to come to her room, and I'll position myself behind an heiress and do what? I'll spy on him. Okay? King, it shall be so. Madness and great ones must not unwatched go. Why? Why shouldn't madness and great ones go unwatched? Dangerous. Man, louder? Dangerous. Why? All right, let me, let me do this. Give me an example, a real world example, of a quote unquote great one whose madness kind of went unwatched in. Let's say wreaked havoc on the world. How about Hitler? How can I call Hitler a quote unquote great one? Look what Hitler did. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm not saying great morally positive, great consequential. He turned Germany around. During the midst of the Great Depression, the Great Depression wasn't just the United States. It was the whole world. He turned Germany around, got it out of the Great Depression before all other industrialized nations. How did he do that? He started building up an army. Okay? And when he started building up an army, the others who unwatched him should have watched him and said, not good. There actually was one person, Winston Churchill, who said, not good. He's building up his army. We should build up ours. Okay. So, scene two. We're not going to talk about much. Hamlet talks with some of the players. And this is where, line one and following, Hamlet gives acting advice to the players. In almost all scholars, if they write about this scene, they tell us, or, or they agree, 
This is Shakespeare. This is Shakespeare telling the actors in his acting company, don't butcher my lines. Don't butcher my words. Don't go out there swinging your hands all around and gesticulating. Speak, he says. Speak the speech trippingly as I told you. That is, speak it as it should be spoken. Okay? And he talks about boys, actors, who sometimes mess up the stuff. So that could be Shakespeare's way of telling the young boy actors in the acting company, don't F up my lines. This, this is important stuff. Okay? So, Hamlet has a conversation with Horatio, page 1649, beginning line 60, uh, 45 and following. And top of 1650, he's, he's telling Horatio what a good friend Horatio is to him. That I can really trust you, Horatio. Okay? Top of 1650, about line, I don't know, 58, 59 or so. 59. I might need to start. He's talking about those who have, you know, really shown their friendship, etc. That top of 1650 now. That they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. Okay? It's a metaphor of using a flute. All right? Why is that important? Because in just a couple of pages, Hamlet's going to use that exact same metaphor with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Right? He's going to say, you guys think I'm like a flute that you can play on, that you can make me speak what you want me to speak. So, we get the play within the play. And bottom of page 1650, uh, line 89, no, line 94, the queen says, Hamlet, Sit by me. And Hamlet sees Ophelia. He says, No, good mother, here's metal more attractive. That is, he's kind of saying, She's metal, I'm a magnet, I'm attracted to her. Polonius, see, told you, it's my daughter, that's why it's crazy. So Hamlet says to Ophelia, Lady, shall I lie in your lap? And he lies down at Ophelia's feet, puts his head in her lap. So, shall I lie in your lap? She says, no, my lord. Why? Because she takes lie in your lap to mean she's horizontal, he's horizontal on top of her. I, I mean my head upon your lap. I, my lord, that is, I know what you mean. Because bear in mind, head can refer to two different body parts, for men at least. Do you think I meant country matters? And in Shakespeare's day, that word country, oh, I, gotta, I don't remember what their gloss says. It's something stupid. Line 101. Yeah, with a body pun. The word country in Shakespeare's day was often spelled C-U-N-T-R-Y. When I used to um, work on this edition of a Renaissance poet um, who used the word country a lot, of almost every instance in manuscripts, that is, handwritten books and stuff, it was spelled this way. Why? So it can be punned on. So that you can make a pun on the word country. So, Hamlet, you think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. So, he says country, and that's how it would have been pronounced, not country. Okay? She says, I think nothing, my lord. How do you think nothing? How do you represent nothing? How do you represent nothing numerically? It's an O, right? Okay. That's a fair thought to lie between maids' legs. What? Hamlet's thinking country matters. She says, I think nothing, my lord. Hamlet, that's a fair thought. What? What she just said. What is my lord? Nothing. What's the nothing that lies between a maid's legs? The vagina. 
This is an example of Shakespeare's punning. He loves puns, and he loves double entendre, okay? For the simple reason of what? Go back to the globe. What kind of audience does he have? He's got these people up here who are paying good money for their seats. And he's got these people here, the groundlings, who pay a penny, who quote unquote aren't intellectual, who are laborers, who are the people with predominantly, we think, dirty minds, who love this kind of humor. And who are, you know, slapping each other in the face. what he just said, why the main flames could be. Okay. They're getting a kick at us. So they're, you know, rolling on the floor laughing while the snooty ones up here are like, I can't believe he said that. I mean, that's just, that's irresponsible. That's not appropriate. Okay. While secretly snickering inside, thinking that's pretty witty. Okay. So. He goes on, or, or he goes on talking with Ophelia and the others. Player King comes in, says a bunch of lines, <coughs> skipping a bunch. Go to pay, um, page 1653, line 210 and following. So while the Player King and Queen are doing their part, Hamlet kind of does a line-by-line -line commentary. Okay? And the king asks him, what do you call the play? Hamlet, the mousetrap. And then he goes on. And he says, how? Well, it's about a murder of Gonzago. And your footnote tells you there was a real guy in 1538. Luigi Gonzago murdered the Duke of Urbano by pouring poison lotion in his ears. Okay? So, they keep talking about it. And in the dumb show, that is where the kind of the the actors mime the action. We see the poison poured in the sleeping king's ear. And Hamlet comments on it. But poisons him in the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. Uh, excuse me, Gonzago. Story is excellent, written in very choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. And Ophelia, the king rises. King doesn't just rise. He gets up and flees. He runs out, okay? So, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, after everybody leaves, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern go up to Hamlet, and they try to find out what's wrong. Why are you so troubled, okay? And Hamlet kind of keeps kind of batting them away, and then some players come in, and one of the players comes in with a recorder, and Hamlet borrows it. And Hamlet hands it to Guildenstern. Will you play upon this pipe? My lord, I cannot. This is line 314. I pray you, I, I can't. I beseech you, I, I know no touch of it. It's easy as lying. The reason why he says lying, because he knows Guildenstern's lying. Govern these vintages, that is, put your fingers on the holes, put it to your mouth, blow, and move your fingers. Look, you, these are, but these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. And that's when Hamlet has him. Why, look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. And if I were directing, I would have Hamlet take that recorder and smack him with it. To really emphasize, you think I'm like this recorder. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass, and there is much music. Excellent voice in this little organ. Remember, he's told us several times, there's a lot going on inside. Yet cannot you make it speak? Blood, do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me, you cannot play upon me. You're not going to get me to tell you what's... Okay. So Polonius comes in. Tells Hamlet, the queen would like to speak with you. Okay. He says, fine, cool. They all leave. Hamlet gets a little soliloquy. 
And Hamlet says, I'll go talk to my mother. But he also tells us it's the very witching time of night. That is, it's midnight. Well, what happens on midnight? The ghost appears. So he says, I'll go talk to my mother, and I will speak daggers to her. He's going to make her feel guilty. Okay. King, meanwhile, scene three, speaks with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and he says, I'm going to send Hamlet. You guys are going to escort him, etc., etc. Polonius comes in, tells the king, I've sent for Hamlet to go to his mother. I'll hide behind the heiress in her room. And the king gets a soliloquy. Keep in mind, soliloquy is his innermost thoughts. And what do we see Claudius express? Is guilt. Is guilt. Okay? And he finishes big, long soliloquy, saying, line 69, help angels make a say, that is, make trial, bow stubborn knees, heart with strings of steel, be soft as sinews of the newborn babe, all may be well. And he kneels. So when he says that, help angels, he's asking the angels to help him be repentant. All right? Because he knows everything he's done and still doing, sleeping with his dead brother's wife, it's wrong. Hamlet comes in, walks by the door, and sees Claudius back to him on his knees and pulls out his sword. Now might I do it bad. But he doesn't. Why not? Because reason casts this, you know, sick, pale cast of thought over action, he told us in the previous, in the previous soliloquy. He sees him. He can kill him right now. Why doesn't he? Because he starts to think. Well, he killed Dad. Dad wasn't praying when he died. Dad didn't offer, have an opportunity to go to a priest and seek absolution, so he died with the sins on his head. Therefore, he had to go to purgatory, and he's got to stay there until all those sins are burned away. Then he'll go to heaven. If I kill him now, while he's in the midst of prayer, asking for forgiveness, he goes straight to heaven. Well, screw that, man. That's not revenge. That's giving him what he wants, ultimately. No, he says. No. Line 89. When he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed. Ooh, that's when I'll kill him. Think about that image for a moment, by the way. If he's in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, and he goes to stab him, who might also get killed? Mom. <laughs> Okay. Hamlet leaves. What does he not realize? Because he's left too soon. There's no sincerity in Claudius' prayers. It's all empty words. Just like Claudius said, Hamlet's speech, Hamlet's soliloquy, so-called soliloquy, those words did not mean anything about love. The words and the emotion weren't joined. Well, neither are Claudius's, because he said, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Why? Because he can say, Oh, I'm sorry, God, but what's he planning on doing that evening? He's going to jump into Gertrude's bed, and he's still going to reap the benefits of the crimes he's committed, okay? Scene four, okay? Polonius enters the queen's room, hides behind the curtain. Hamlet comes in, and she says, no, excuse me, Hamlet says, now, mother, what's the matter? That is, why did you want to speak to me? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Notice, I don't have time to go into this. Notice the different pronouns. Hamlet, thou hast thy father. The, the, 
thou, thy. Hamlet, mother, you have. Okay, the, the TH forms, that's the form used by an older person speaking to a younger person. Okay. It's also the form used among family, tight, close individuals. Okay. It's also the form used by a higher member of society to a lower member of society. The Y forms indicate distance, emotional distance. They also indicate inferior to a superior. Okay. And Shakespeare does that throughout his plays. He helps indicate societal stature by his use of pronouns. I won't say anything else about it. So, they go on, and they continue talking, and the queen thinks Hamlet's going to kill her. And she says, line 21, What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help, help, ho. And we hear Polonius behind the heiress. <coughs> what ho? Help, help, help. Hamlet, how now? A rat? Uh, and he stabs. Okay. Polonius, I am slain. Queen, oh, Hamlet, what have you done? Hamlet, I don't know. Is it the king? Well, he just left the king. How'd the king get up there before he did? But he asks, is it the king? Indicating, please let it be the king. Pulls the curtain back. Polonius. Hamlet says, Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. Calls him a fool. When was the last time he referred to Polonius as a fool? The end of his conference, his conversation with Ophelia, when he told her, tell your father to play the fool in his own house, or he might get burned. Well, burned. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Thou finds to be too busy is some danger. Too busy means to be busying yourself in other people's affairs. Leave ringing of your hands. Peace, sit you down. He's talking to her mother, his mother. For so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff, if damned custom hath not braised it so, that it be proof and bulwark against and the queens. What have I done? Why are you talking like this against me? And he does what? Verbally. Boom, boom. He gives her both barrels. You have... And he says that she is in cahoots with Claudius. You knew what Claudius did. You knew Claudius killed my father. Okay? She's like, no, 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 no. And he talks about his father. He talks about Claudius. And she says, line 49, Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turnst mine eyes into my very soul. In other words, she perceives herself. And there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their tint. 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 Sullied. Okay. She looks inwardly, and what does she see? Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh. Oh, that this too, too sullied soul. She sees what the psalmist saw. When he looked inward in Psalm, depending on which version of the Bible you have, 50 or 51, it's when David admits his guilt over having slept with Bathsheba, killed her husband, so that he could have her as his wife and such. Okay? So, Hamlet says, No, but to live in the rank sweat of an encement bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love, okay, Rank sweat and semen, that's in semen bed, stewed, stews, S-T-E-W-S, in Shakespeare's day. That was the name for the red light district, for brothels. Okay? She says, stop, stop. No more. Hamlet goes on. A murderer and a villain, talking about Claudius, etc., etc. She says, no more. It's like Hamlet is verbally beating her down. And she's like, no, no, no. And the ghost comes in. Right? And he sees the ghost and he starts talking to her. She's like, uh, Hamlet, who are you talking to? Him. Don't you see him? She doesn't see him. Okay. 
So the ghost tells him, leave her alone. She says, Hamlet, you're crazy. Page one, uh, line 140, just before that. Hamlet says, ecstasy? Come here, Mom. Feel my pulse. Come on, feel it. It beats as intemperately as yours, or temperately as yours. In other words, if I were crazy, my pulse would be beating 140, 150 beats a minute. No, it's good 60, 65. No, you're trying to ease your own conscience by saying I'm crazy. He says, test me. Come on, any way you want. Lay not that flattering unction, that salve, that healing potion to your soul, that not your trespass, but my madness be. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place. That is, if you do that, if you merely try to cover it over with, oh, Hamlet's mad, and that ulcer that you have in your soul isn't dealt with, then what's going to happen? It's going to run. What happens if you get, you know, frostbite in the winter and you don't get it taken care of? Gangrene sets in. What happens after gangrene sets in long enough? You lose your fingers, you lose your toes, you lose your ears, you lose your nose, you lose all those extremities because the gangrene eventually will do what? It just moves up the body, right? That's what he's saying. That's what's gonna happen to your soul. So you need to deal with this. So he says, line 150, confess yourself to heaven. Get down on your knees and say, Oh God, I have sinned against you. All right? Repent what's past. Repent means what? Turn around. Turn around from the past. All right? Avoid what is to come. Well, that means bedroom, Claudius, go the other direction. And do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them ranker. She says, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise, David says in this psalm. Her heart, cloven in two, it's broken. Hamlet says all she needs now is what? Contrition. She needs to feel really sorry for what she's done. So Hamlet says, throw away the worser part of it. In that same psalm, David says, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. So throw away the bad part. Think of the image I had over here of the stock with the old Adam. Get rid of that. Replace it with the new Adam, the virtuous life, he says. Live pure with the other half. Good night, but don't go to my uncle's bed. Why? Assume a virtue if you have it not. What does that mean, assume? Modern English just means pretend. Pretend you can be virtuous. What's the virtue he's talking about? Don't sleep with my uncle. Pretend you can be chaste. Real chaste, not incestuous chaste, okay? In Shakespeare's day, it had that meaning, but it also meant put on the clothing. Put on the outward appearance of virtue. Behave virtuously, even if you aren't internally virtuous. Why? Because that monster custom who all sense doth eat, since sensory perception, it's based upon sensory perception, of habit's devil is angel yet in this, that to the use of actions fair and good, he likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on. Put that in modern English. How do you stop smoking? How do you stop drinking? With the first drink, you don't take. With the first cigarette, you don't smoke. And how do you continue it? With the second cigarette, you don't smoke. And the second cigarette you don't, uh, the second drink you don't take. That is, when you first stop smoking and you've told yourself, 
I'm not going to smoke this cigarette. Does that mean you're suddenly virtuous, quote unquote, if that's the virtue? No, it doesn't. Because what's going to happen? <laughs> and so you smoke one, and then you later on don't smoke two. Does that mean, ah, oh, I'm, I've achieved it now. I've written it. Nope. Because for most people, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle until it is kicked. Same thing with drinking, right? So he says custom which is normally bad, can be turned to good. Because if you assume a virtue tonight, not to sleep with your husband, that'll make what about tomorrow night? It'll make it easier not to sleep with your husband. And if you can do it tonight, tomorrow night, that'll make the third night easier still. And guess what will happen eventually? This is Shakespeare kind of teaching his audience. Even if you are not now virtuous, if you assume, if you pretend, if you put on virtue, guess what's going to happen eventually? Internally, you become virtuous. Why? Because you stop doing the unvirtuous action. So, refrain tonight, that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy. For use almost can change, almost can change the stamp of nature. That's the old stock. That's the quote-unquote original sin. Notice he says, use almost can. Because what's use there mean? Behavior, action, put in theological terms, works can almost wipe out sin. Shakespeare can't go that far, though. Why? Because Queen Elizabeth is Protestant, and he's writing in a Protestant day and age. And if he says, by your own works, by your own behavior, you can wipe out your sins, he's going to have a ton of bishops coming down on him like a ton of bricks, Protestant bishops, who are going to say, this is heresy. This is blasphemy. He's got to die. And so he can't do that, which is why he says, it can almost change the stamp of nature and either something the devil or throw him out. All right? A couple more minutes. So he says, once more, good night. Don't go to my uncle's bed. All right? So she says, what shall I do? He says, don't go to his bed. All right? So he tells her what about his trip to England. His concluding speech, our last minute. There's letters sealed, and my two schoolfellows, like 203, whom I will trust, there's the quiz, as I will adders fanged. They bear the mandate. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work. <clears throat> Why? For tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own pitar. Pitar, that's the bomb. That's the explosion the engineer uses to blow up the mine. The mine. He says, I know what they're going to do. And I'm going to switch the letters. They are doing this to get in good graces with the king. You know what's going to happen? They're going to be the ones who die, not me. Okay, we will stop there. Pick up with Act 4 on Tuesday. And hopefully, yeah, I think we'll be able to get through Act 4. Thank you.